The following is a production of Texas Lutheran University. For more information, please visit tlu.edu. Um, I'm Dr. Perez. Um, and we have two speakers who are going to come talk to us today about the uh, conservation plan for both the Sa uh, San Marcos and City of New, New Braunfels. Braunfels. City of New Braunfels. Uh, but what, ri what river? Come out. Come out. Land of Park area? Yeah, Land of Park area. Um, so this is Melanie Howard and Zachary Martin. And um, Melanie is from the San Marcos, uh, City of San Marcos, but also from uh, Texas. Texas State University, where she got her master's degree. Mm -hmm. Okay, great, thank you. Okay, Bye. so why don't you start and tell them a little bit about the HEP? Hmm? Sure. Uh, again, I'm Zach. I work for the city of New Braunfels. I also uh, graduated at Texas State or Southwest, depends on what, what year it is. Um, my master's is in geography, uh, but we do a lot of environmental work there in New Braunfels. And just like the the, the HCP, the Habitat Conservation Plan, is a larger structure that incorporates uh, the city of San Marcos, San Antonio water system, the Edwards Rock for Authority. There's a lot of players in a big, it's a big picture plan focusing mainly on water quality and, and trying to enhance the habitat for the endangered species in two different systems on the springs, the Comal Springs and the San Marcos area. So there's, there's, two, there's, there's various, I call them critter habitat, so there's a couple critters, there's some wild rice, vegetation, there's a lot of different variables going on that we're trying to enhance, make better, clean up, uh, restructure to, to have a better ecosystem overall. And that's where Melanie's a little bit more, she's a biologist at heart, and so she can probably talk more the, the, the biology terms than I could. Um, but the big picture plan is what we're trying to focus on. So we're gonna, we're gonna have a, a presentation with her. I have an additional presentation, but it's, we're probably just gonna focus on hers because the projects are very similar, uh, enhancing the habitat for the critters. Um, so that's, that's what we're going to be talking about today. Now, if you have questions and whatnot, I'm sure there's going to be a question and answer session at the end. Um, please, please feel free to ask questions, you know, anything even related to this or anything, uh, you know, that, about the cities in general, we can answer those questions. Because uh, this kind of thing is, is a 15-year plan. It, this is just the first year. We just started out in 2013. 2014 is the second year. So we're kind of, we're kind of, Take, as we take steps on the 15-year plan, we have to kind of tweak things as we figure out what works, what doesn't, what do we need to tweak here. Okay, this didn't work. Let's go this direction. We kind of have to navigate through, no pun intended for streams, but we have to kind of figure <laughs> things out as we go. So it's, it's, uh, it's very loose. It's very flexible plan, and we have, there's a lot of money invested, so we want to make sure we, we utilize that correctly. Um, so that's, that's the big picture, it's kind of an overview. And just to give you the, the organizational, like the governmental structure of a Habitat Conservation Plan, this is a, a document, it's a Section 10A document for the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. And it's actually, this is a permit, and it's a permit that the Fish and Wildlife gives the users um, to take an endangered species. Because you know the Endangered Species Act, and that says that if you harm, which even means disturb down to kill an endangered species, then you violated this federal act. So this is a way to harm or endanger or take um, one of the listed species and have a permit to do so. And because it's a permit, a federal permit, that's the take side of it. And then Zach and I get to do the, the good side of it, making their their habitat in these two river systems better so that we increase the populations in both systems. In my system, I have Texas wild rice. We'll get a look at that in the slides. We both have the fountain darter. We both have the Comal Springs riffle beetle. And then he's got some additional beetles in the, in the Comal River. How many of you have ever been to the San Marcos or Comal River? Excellent, that helps a lot. That helps a lot. Because that way you'll have, you'll have in your head, you'll have a picture of the rivers as we go through this. So um, let's present this. This is the, actually, Zach, we're very, very lucky. I, I know sometimes you don't feel like you are, but, but our jobs are incredibly unique, and we run the jobs from A to Z. They're all ours. We're the only ones that are really know what's going on, um, and it's just a lot of fun. It's like doing a project, and it's all your project. So the first, of, the first of the projects that I like to start out with is a big overview project. WQP, QPP Water Quality Protection Plan. So we have a river that runs through San Marcos, the city of San Marcos. It's fed by 
Purgatory Creek, Sink Creek, Willow Creek, and a little teeny one called Sesame Creek. If we're going to do things in the river to make the habitat better for the endangered species, with a focus on the Texas wild rice, then we need to look at the whole watershed and make uh, law changes, ordinance changes, regulation changes in the watershed that, so that we're protecting, we're protecting water quality throughout the whole thing. So by the time it rains out here in Purgatory Creek, it's by the time that water, the runoff from the rain, gets to the river, then it's good quality and it's not going to destroy the efforts that we're investing there on the river. So we have a long way to go in this study. It's done and we're going to start implementing it this year, which is very exciting. And, and City of San Marcos, or City of New Braunfels, is actually working on the same kind of plan. We're just a couple of years behind them. So the same project, just a different year status, really. Mm -hmm. And like the Alligator Geronimo Creek nearby, well, there's, that's also a WPP kind of project that's local. It's more local in this area. This is something Zach is probably more familiar with. So the WKPP, as most plans in today's world are, they're backed up by GIS. And so these are the various layers that we reach into. You want to look into topography. You want to look into land use. What's going on in the watershed that could ultimately harm the river? So that data has been pulled together. We've created models that say, OK, if I change this amount of impervious cover, rooftops, streets, driveways. If we reduce that, what impact does it have? So we look for those areas that we can change that'll make a difference for the river. Any, anybody taking the GIS class that's offered here? Anyone? If you get a chance, it's, it's, it's quite an interesting class. Introduction, I think it's called Inter GIS 1 or whatever it's called. One, it's Job Getter 2. Oh, Geographic Information System. <laughs> it's it's kind of like a, like I said, I, I'm kind of more of a GIS person. Uh, especially with the geography background. It's just kind of like Google Earth. You can log into Google Earth. On the bottom left corner, there's like these little things you can click and toggle on and off. And it's essentially, it's a layer of maps. There's a bunch of maps. Every, every layer is like one map of septic data, one's agriculture, one's land use, commercial projects, uh, roads would be one layer. So you can turn that on and off in Google Earth. That's, that's a good example. Uh, it's a real basic idea. Um, but some of this, like with the water quality mapping, uh, you need to have a, a, a GIS component to kind of see what's going on in your watershed and how to try to, it, there's many variables, I could go on and on about that. There's many variables to try to fix a watershed because there's so many components to it. Well, and, and it's GIS used GIS, and we're not here to promote GIS, but GIS is used for everything. You can analyze any topic that you can think of with GIS. And in more and more and more jobs, GIS background is important. So just, just food for thought, because I know you're in the market for a career someday. GIS is a hugely it, important thing to it have. It really applies to almost any, any career, really. Mm -hmm. It's kind of hard to conceive, but it really does. Um, modeling. So in 2014, with the WQPP, we're going to start. We've got to train the staff at the city, train the staff at the university, because they don't think about when they're going, they're putting a, ridge over, a bridge over a road, they're not thinking, Oh my gosh, Purgatory Creek flows underneath it. How can we protect it? That's the last thing on their mind. So we've got to switch their paradigm. Um, we're pulling in stakeholders because the development community is not going to be happy about the WQPP. We're going to try to show them economically how it is advantageous. We can make it a win-win for everybody. So that's our, that's our goal for 2014. Another one of our programs, we both have this one, is Household Hazardous Waste, and that is just to help increase the outreach of the collection of things like paints and chem household chemicals. Gather them so they don't end up in the river. So the HCP is funding an expansion of our Household Hazardous Waste program. What about you? Oh, same thing. I was about to say, these pictures look like you stole them off the mine. <laughs> the, 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 I have exact, almost exactly the same pictures. Somebody driving up in a truck, dropping off their... We have, uh, I think we have four events per year where they drop mm -hmm. off paint, chemicals that you have in the back shed or whatever, stuff that we, you, know, you find in the backyard or the back 40, um, and you can drop it off. And this way it doesn't, you know, people don't throw it in the creek or they don't throw it in the back ditch or dump it down the storm sewer, which, which still happens to this day, which is kind of shocking. Because that stuff will eventually lead into the river, which has a fish kill effect and some of the other problems. So, so what this is a map showing um, the areas that we target to collect household hazardous mm -hmm. waste, HHW, because the blue is the recharge zone. That's the part of the Edwards Aquifer, that underground river that feeds both of our rivers. Um, everything, every time it rains, if you've got 
paint and it spills over, it's going straight into the aquifer. That aquifer, aquifer flows underground, it springs up in the Colmel River, in the San Marcos River, and there you go, you've got contamination in your river. So we target those areas for collection. And this is, I don't know what this is, we'll skip it. Um, and so some slides I'm gonna skip because this, this was made for a target audience, the Edwards Aquifer Authority, when we were doing our 2013 reports. And this is a series of maps coming up showing the locations where all my contractors are working. And we're gonna get into this anyway, so we don't need to do it now. Bank stabilization, again, another project that we've both done. There are areas, the San Marcos River, you've been there. Have you been there during the summer? Obviously, there are a thousand million people on the San Marcos River, and they're all trying to get in the river. And so when you have foot traffic after foot traffic trying to get in the river, this is what happens. You have bank erosion, you lose a lot of soil, you get compaction, you lose vegetation that was once growing in that area. All this, those things are terribly horrible for water quality. You get sedimentation in the river, you get other kinds of pollutants coming in. So, so, the, so the most drastic pollution for the critters is sediment. Yep. Not chemicals, not anything else, it's sediment. That's the one thing that's the, that's the worst. I'm sure so what we, we did was we, one of your classes already. we targeted these areas for bank stabilization projects. Makes sense. And I thought, well, if I'm going to stabilize a bank, why the heck wouldn't I also make it an access point? So we used a terraced kind of stabilization with some landscaping. And it's a huge area for people can sit, they can walk into the water, they don't have to climb, it's safe, it's attractive. And then I've incorporated that with a strategy of increasing the intensity or the density of vegetation between all my access points. So it's like telling the people, here's a great place to get in, and then making the tree dense area unattractive so they don't want to come in that way. And that preserves my banks. And that's similar. We have, we have the same kind of setup. And if you've been over to Hinman Island and over by the tennis courts where you get into the go tubing in the water, they have like a tiered kind of structure that kind of guides you to a certain area. They have some areas that are gated off. And we have a, actually, well, by the golf course and uh, that area, there's actually a, a, a slope that's a little higher than that, but it looks just like this. It's degraded, it's falling apart. And we, we can't really hard armor, this is called like a hard armoring kind of re repair. Uh, they want to make it more aesthetic, uh, aesthetically pleasing with a uh, natural, uh, natural look, which is a lot more complicated engineering wise. So we're spending a lot more time in design, which takes longer, which is actually, we should have had it done already, but if we would have done this, it would have been faster. But we want to make it look more like this without the slope and have it nice and green with trees and, and look, make it look natural, which takes a lot longer, a lot more money. Um, so we have an almost identical problem. But that's not where they're going into the river to go tubing, but they, we, we're mm -hmm. sloughing off for other, other reasons. Water runoff from rain events and, and very, it's just an older system. So. I remember I've, this is the first, um, I'm a biologist and so um, I'm not a construction project manager. This is the f first construction project I've ever done and I was totally in charge. Um, you know, I, I researched, I did the study, I thought I had everything done the right way, and I, so I got up at 6.30, I checked my iPhone, and there was this message with red flag all over it. They drove the excavator into the river, which is a huge <laughs> no-no. And so they drove this big machine you see in these photos. They drove it straight into the river so they could place this rock out in the river. Uh, <sighs> so I, that, that project's <laughs> over, and I am so glad. Your permit, like, I back. still have a job. <laughs> Jeez. Um, these are these are the other sites. It says 2014, and he's he's done. He's already completed all the sites. So we have six or seven sites all up and up and down the river. Come back this summer. Come take a look at the sites. Um, I would be glad. We'll give our numbers at the end of this. I'll be glad to hear any comments you might have about what you think of them. Um, the next project, the third project, is to get rid of elephant ears. Have you all seen those along? We both have those, too. His are bigger. His elephant ears have a bigger leaf to them. Yeah, ours are over by the gazebo. If you know where Landa Park is, over the gazebo area, we had a long uh, across. It almost looks uh, quite like this, actually, and they, we've actually removed all of ours. You've got to do multiple applications because they're really hard to get out. Mm -hmm. Super uh, hard. Completely. So why would you want to get rid of this plant? Does anybody have any idea? Exactly. It's invasive. Good answer. It was introduced in the early 1900s, late 1800s. 
because it is very attractive. People love it. And but an invasive does exactly that. And so from headwaters all the way down to the Blanco confluence, nothing but elephant ears in the littoral zone of the river. So that destroys habitat um, for different kinds of native animals. And so we want to get rid of them. And these all, by the way, are all fish and wildlife projects. These are projects they want to see done that's in the recovery plan. We didn't just make these up. So we have a contractor, EBR Enterprises, that comes through. And he worked for me as a volunteer before he actually got this job. That was kind of cool. Wow. So the benefits of volunteering. Um, <clears throat> and he comes through and he uses a drip spray, <coughs> uh, uses rodeo, or he uses triclopyr depending on where he is in, in the littoral zone. Drips it onto the leaf, it soaks it down into the tuber, and it kills the plant. But as Zach said, under that tuber is another tuber. So when he's gone, another one comes up where they vegetatively grow in every direction. And so you get baby after baby after baby. The areas that he's worked along the river, I won't go into any of that. But those are some of the stats that I presented to the EAA. And, and since they do look so nice and they've been there for so many years, you get the the population or the, 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 the neighbors that, oh, but that's natural and that belongs there. Actually, it doesn't. It's, it's invasive. It doesn't belong here. It's not good for the beetle habitat. You know, there's a lot of biology and a lot of science behind why they need to remove. So that's why a lot of our job is public education and outreach and, and teaching the populace in a very easy to understand terminology why we're taking these out, even though, oh, but this is pretty. Well, it's not good for the habitat, and, and trying to teach them an ecosystem balance of what's really going on is, is sometimes difficult because they don't have a biology background. And I didn't either about a year ago. I know a little bit about endangered species. I worked for the state and did a couple of, couple of years of this kind of thing. But when you're a biologist, it's a different, you know, it's a different way of looking at things. Sure. So I've had to learn quite a bit in a year very quickly. I spent a lot of time with the biologists in the field stomping around, <laughs> looking at beetles, looking at critters. Uh, so it's, it helps me educate the, the, the neighbors and the populace when they, when they start getting grouchy because they, they don't want you tearing up their, their stuff because they grew up with this kind of, mm -hmm. you know, this kind of landscape. Changing their world. And it's, not, it's, not, it sh it's not good for the environment. So that's why we're talking to you today so that when you go to the river this summer and you hit, get on tube and you hear somebody complaining, you're like, hey, let me tell you about this. Yeah. <laughs> okay, this is... The riparian management. Now, this is some, that's a bunch of elephant ears. After they've been treated, yeah. they just kind of wilt back. How many times do you have to apply? Three or four? Um, you can hit a stand one time, and that stand will absolutely die back. But then you it'll, get regrowth. It'll pop up. I think we so had they, at least three, three different times of chemical yeah. uh, application. They have to do a lot of mop up. Yeah. And these are just showing, these maps are bringing you from the top all the <clears> way down. <throat> showing the different locations along the river the EBR is working. And I've done that for every contractor. So if I flip through, that's what I'm doing, just showing all the different areas. So what I've done um, is I've embedded some videos. Since you can't go to the river and talk to our contractors, we've embedded videos that will bring them to you. Next, next contractor. We bring all our contractors together about three times a year, and we eat and drink and talk about our projects. And I've really gotten to know them. It's been this has been a really fun project. Um, every river has litter in it. If there's people, there's litter, and people are everywhere. So in the watershed, the area that drains into the river, in the watershed, if you drop a piece of paper or plastic in the watershed, eventually it's going to end up in the river. So we have a company called Pristine Texas Rivers. They go and they take, pick up the litter on the bottom of the river, along the sides, and then they go up all four tributaries. They walk up them because they're ephemeral tributaries, seasonal, and they remove litter. So these are just some pictures also they will remove the floating mats. In every system you're going to have this, but in our system, 
happens a little more quickly because you have more people in the river and they can stack up. They get really thick. I mean, when they, once they're stacked on top, they get deeper and deeper and deeper. So he just pulled the, pulls those out of the river too. It's, that's not so much a habitat thing as it is recreational, but it's, it's a good PR piece for yeah, us. Yeah, because we use the same company and they come and do the same thing. They dislodge the vegetation mats. They're so thick you can walk on them after a week. They do it every week. Mm -hmm. They go over there in the boats and they can actually walk on it, kind of jar it through with a big stick kind of force it down river and then they do the scuba ding like so they do mm -hmm. scuba and they go in and they clean out a significant portion of, of trash it's i went snorkeling a couple of months ago with a citizen that complaint yeah and i get to go snorkeling how cool is that for a job and so i grabbed some gear and <laughs> jumped in the water I, I couldn't believe how clean the bottom of the river was because i grew up around here going tubing in the comal and atlanta and uh, I was stunned at how really I got an up close look at how clean it was and how, how much work they'd done. It's Wasn't amazing. last year, the year before, the article about all the cans in the Comal River, aluminum cans? Yeah. Covering the bottom. Like somebody it, it was, else saw I mean, that. You never went tubing it was unless you had disgusting. shoes on or some kind of aqua socks or whatever. You, you did not go barefoot ever. I just knew that growing up. So when I went snorkeling you know, last summer, and it was like, oh my gosh. Yeah, it they was do a beautiful good job. habitat, and it was fish. You could see everything. It was awesome. This is some of the tributary, because um, you get a lot of trash in your tributaries, because you've got homes along all of them, and commercial industry, et cetera, et cetera. These are just some of the places that he, he cleans, and examples of the floating mats. And then we also, as New Braunfels says, we also put out litter boats. So as you're tubing along the river, you'll pass a litter boat. And you can see that um, they're used for just about everything. During the summer, we have to clean these out about twice a day. And then all our signs, we try to make them in Spanish and English. Again, just lining up the litter further down, further down, some statistics. Anything else on the trash? You're good? No, not really. That's, that's okay. the big picture stuff. Heritage Tree Care, um, they are hired to do riparian restoration. So remember way back in the bank stabilization, we talked about the strategy <clears throat> we're trying to use. So this is the company that's planting plants and shrubs in between all the access points. This is a map from the San Marcos River showing a couple of the areas that they did in 2013. And what we've had to do, of course, is put a fence along all those areas. So what we're doing, we're not only removing elephant ears, which the people think are beautiful, um, we're fencing off areas of the river where people commonly got in. So we're hugely unpopular. So we try to do a, use a strategy of, since we have all this fence area, we put signs along our fences so that when they walk up to the fence, there's this whole sign telling them everything that we do, why we're doing it, and what it's going to look like, and that someday these fences will come down. Uh, there's some of the areas that he has worked on to restore, and let's let him tell you a little bit about that. This one's kind of hard to hear. There was a lot of wind. So along the river, we have a lot of invasives. Waxy ligustrum, look, and these are so common. You'll see them everywhere. China berry, Chinese tallow, paper, paper mulberry, everywhere. So those are coming down. The first time we did it, we set up the fence. They went behind there. They took out all those invasives, and the bank was, gosh, 70% clear. So it made a huge difference. We've had a lot of comments on it, but then they go right back in and plant. A lot of small native seedlings. We also have volunteer. <coughs> oh, I have another one. Oh, yeah, Zach. This is the other contractor. Same company in this one. 
Not me and others. Oh, different Zach. Different Zach. Yes, not this Zach. I'm not doing stuff on the side or anything. <laughs> well, that's Derek. Oh, this is their erosion, how they control erosion. New Braunfels does the same thing near the gazebo on our slope. Same thing. It's very good. It's very natural. So they're putting the they're putting the the exotic species. They're cutting down the trunks and they're actually building like a little footing. So as yep. the as the erosion keep continues to happen, it'll kind of build up and build like a little shelf. So it'll actually keep it from going in the water, and then that will eventually revegetate, and you'll have a nice stable platform. Exactly. And that's what we're also doing too to keep the sediment out of the water, so the riffle beetles can thrive and the fountain darter and everything else. So. And this is a photo of their planting. So. Um, behind, and I caught a little bit of flack for this the other day at a meeting when I did a presentation, for five to ten feet behind the fence, they will plant what I call prohibitive plants like prickly pear and acacia and agarita, lots and lots of thorns, flowering mimosa, because that's the area we, we, we really don't want you to come through here. So let's help you understand that. <laughs> Poison ivy. Poison <laughs> ivy. No, that's too indirect. See, they get into the poison <laughs> ivy, and the next day they're broken out, but they're like, how'd this happen? It so is. They want immediate response. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right. Instant, instant pain. So we have volunteer days because there's just not enough money, and there's a whole lot of open land. So we get uh, volunteers from the community, and we have planting days. We do eight a year, four in the spring, four in the fall, and then we start to fill in the, the open areas with native trees. And these native trees are provided by Fish and Wildlife, so they're a partner with us in, in this effort. That's all of us out there working away. New Brothers doesn't do any of that. We don't like trees. So. <laughs> this lady, Diane Wasenick, she is such a go-getter. She, she ha makes all this possible for me. She's awesome. She is awesome. I love volunteers. Atlas, um, I don't know if you guys do this. You, you guys do this. Atlas Enterprises, Atlas Environmental, is really a one-man show <clears throat> and Nick Machaka is his name and he gets out there he used to be an intern for me see volunteers interns get jobs and he is the cutest thing he's got the dreadlocks going on and he gets out there and he's scuba diving and he, he's killing fish essentially is what he's doing he spears or gigs um, suckermouth catfish because they're incredibly inv invasive in both our rivers he gigs the tilapia um, and he removes exotic snails. So here is, are some of the areas he, he gets. And there's a picture of him <clears> with <throat> some Placostomus and tilapia. And there's, there's some line drawings of what they look like. Some of the hot spots for him in the San Marcos River. A little more of the same. Some stats. Um, first year he's done this. First, you know, we've got a lot to learn. We took really different approaches. So. Mine is, is uh, individual with a couple of people that go out pretty much all year long to get fish and your approach. We, uh, we used a large company out of Houston, SWCA. They're a pretty, I think they're a nationwide, if not a mm -hmm. worldwide company. And there's a lot of hardcore biologists there. They have a different big picture approach. You know, the first year you're kind of learning everything. And they used a lot of drift nets and various other techniques to take out the same kind of fish. Um, same exact fish, but they had a team of people. He's and so they came man. out like four times a year? Yeah, and I think this year they're going to be coming out six to seven. Yeah. So, and like I said, the sucker mouth catfish, or the, the placostomus, you know, the sucker fish, as we got to call them, I think we pulled out over three tons of fish last year. Yeah. And so, but they, I think we made a dent because yeah. of the sucker, the, the, the sucker mouth, they're so invasive. The tilapia, you can get those at HEB for $3.99 a pound, <laughs> but... We take them out anyway, which is kind of wasteful, but whatever. That's a whole other thing. But they, we pulled out over three tons the first year. So we're, we're trying to figure out a different approach and a different strategy to be more efficient. Because there's so yeah. many and they're so easy yeah. to catch. It's just you could scoop them up all day long for 12 months out of the year. And, you and then the minute you stop, they have a bajillion more babies yeah, they just, and there you they're, are. They're there again. It's like, yeah. so you have to really think strategically, like, how do we, how do, we do this? Yeah. You know, let's use our brain here. So this is one we're still absolutely learning it's, more on. It's tricky. So this is, hopefully, this one will work. Okay, so if you're squeamish, you may not like this, because this shows him gigging. Shows him in, in night diving and then during the daytime. And I might have to stop it. It goes on and on.
So he's got his flashlight. Now, I've never watched it much past this point. I'm not sure how much longer it goes. <laughs> <laughs> he's working so, on the time. <laughs> no, he's, he's loving this. So the placostomus are not edible. Um, we grind them, and we can use them in compost, and we have a couple of those things going on. And then the tilapia, he's not catching enough yet for us, but we're going to try to give him to the food bank. Still working that process. Oh, I oh, wasn't too bad. Uh, these are just more areas that he's working in and finding hot spots. Okay. So now we move in. So the reason we're, we're, we're taking out the fish. Yes. Right? The reason we're taking out the fish, the big picture here is not because we don't like fish. Is that they're not they're, they're invasive they're not native there's there's for like for land, at least for land to park in our Comal spring system it's it's mostly for like the sucker the sucker mouth will will, will burrow into the bank and actually cause more erosion along the, the bank stabilization will, will erode as well as you know not being in the the, it's the, the, the ecosystem balance you could probably speak more biologically perfectly you're doing could, really well but the, <laughs> the balance is off as well as there's there's just more predators. I mean, the predator, predation balance there is off because even though they, they might not eat fountain darters, but they'll eat whatever. And so if there's a fountain darter or there's some endangered beetle or something floating around, they're like, oh, food. They don't care what it is. So you're actually increasing the risk of removal of this species, mm -hmm. which, you know, shouldn't be there. So we need to start pulling them out. Even That's why we need to be strategic and learn the best way in time management. Mm -hmm. Like this guy's doing it one at a time. Mm -hmm. And I think our guys made a dent, and they had a team of expert biologists and they still are trying to figure it out mm -hmm. so it's not you know like i said every year we'd be flexible and kind of flow with okay what did we learn last year okay let's go this direction next year let's go a little over here and, and get the best bang for our buck essentially because we don't have unlimited funds or unlimited people we utilize interns quite a bit you know the other take home from this that we're um, focusing on our aquaria these this guy came from aquaria species so when you have an aquarium freshwater and you go by that little algae eater type fish that they sell to take the algae off the glass of your aquarium. Well, at the end of the semester, or anybody, you know, he's grown large and you want to do something with him, or you're tired of the tank. Nobody wants to flush a fish down the toilet. So where do you put him? In the river, because they're going to love it. That's how these guys got started. That's how some of our plants, our invasive plants, which we're about to talk about, got started, is from Aquaria. So that's a good message to help us spread. So our next contractor, Meadow Center uh, for Water and the Environment, McWee. This is a team of biologists that work on four of my projects. Removal of the sediments that collect at the bottom of the river, taking out non-native plants that are in the river, replanting native plants, and then, um, and then uh, increasing the Texas wild rice. I have to increase the Texas wild rice in the river, the endangered plant species, to a certain uh, density to meet the, the obligations of this permit. So what they do is they dredge. This is their test site. They went out there and thought, how are we going to do this? We have to use a soft approach. Fish and Wildlife wanted us to dredge in a vacuum style. So they threw together this apparatus. They're on a barge. They've got the pump. They've got the divers in the river. They practiced in Spring Lake. And you can see the effluent. And they just dumped the effluent on the ground, the discharge on the ground, because we weren't really set up yet. We just wanted to see what would happen. We get a lot of water and some silt, but it worked. So that's where they started. Now they're working here further downstream. The yellow area is the area that they have cleared out, like three feet of silt. That whole area has been cleared. And the discharge in a low area in the park itself. I just missed something. These are the guys in that area working from the barge, divers in the water. A little further upstream, they cleared out this area of fine sediment and silt. You can see that is the vacuum head itself. 
And so the diver, and you'll see a video of it, the diver will just kind of vacuum, pull up the sediment, and go back and forth with the vacuum head, and pulls everything into the hose. And we have the same setup in Land of the Lake. We pull out some fine sediments out to enhance the riffle beetle habitat. Same kind of concept, same, just different, different system. Sediment bad, bad. Could get it out of bad, there. Bad, bad. Choking out the critters. Yeah, it really does. So this is going to be quiet for a while while they're underwater. You can see the sediment getting sucked into the holes in the sieve that surrounds the intake, and they're kind of pushing the sediment into it. Coming out the other end, how thick and how black, really rich, good soil. That's, if you went to Home Depot, that's $5 a bag right there. <laughs> that's the best stuff on the planet. <laughs> These are some of the areas that they dredged this year over here, some of the upper areas, and then we're hitting the lower areas uh, I'm sorry, last year. This year we're hitting the lower areas, 2014. They also do vegetation removal because there's a lot of invasive veg in both of our rivers. Hydrilla nationwide, that's in lakes, that clogs everything. We also have hygrophila and a few others that they're picking, like cotton picking by hand. It's a very hands-on process. And we, we, use, we did the same, we have the same kind of problems, same kind of invasives, and we use, instead of using the meadows, which very good company, very good people there. We use BioWest. They're also a nation, nationwide company. They're also of, a very good company. Very also good very, people. Yeah, very good, very smart people there too. Um, biology heavy. And so we, we use them doing the same kind of work exactly. Yes. Okay, these are the areas. Just this map, uh, the different colors are the different plants. So really quickly uh, to show you, for example, this is the hygrophila. It's an invasive. This is before, this is after, spring and fall. Uh, this is Texas wild rice. You can see we've increased the footprint of the Texas wild rice through plantings. Again, the same thing, a before and after. The orange is hygrophila, the bad guy, and you can see it's much decreased with an increase in Cyzania texana, Texas wild rice. This was an area, it was cut grass, it was, that's a terrestrial grass. So they've got so much sedimentation buildup in the river, right in the, uh, the concrete park called Sewell Park. Have you been up there? That's for the university students. Um, so it's just started growing out of the middle of the river. So they went in there and they cut all that, roots and all that was a huge, huge endeavor. A lot of work. But that was before and that was after. That made us very popular with the community, so that was a good thing that we did. <laughs> Um, the purple is the cut grass, so that's just a map showing you the before and the after of the cut grass. This is an underwater picture of the plantings. One of the native plants that the fountain daughter really likes, it's a beautiful little plant, Ludwigia. Within two weeks, you can see how quickly it grows, so we're, we're having a lot of success in all our projects except the invasive fish removal. Before and afters, before and afters. Uh, some of the areas that they've worked and then let them tell you a little bit about it. So he's just picking the hydrilla right out of the soil, put into a mesh bag, and then it goes up to the guys on top. And then after they remove all the hydrilla, then they come in with the vacuum hose and take the silt out. And this is one of the strategies where they remove the invasive plant that's right around the Texas wild rice so it can increase in size. Then they have to check all the vegetation bit by bit for the fountain darters. I, I don't know if this is the same one or a different one. Let's see.
we are tasked with supplying terrestrial and aquatic plants for an HCP pod to revegetate the San Marcos River. Over here we have aquatic plants that we're supplying. They are supplying not only the Texas wild rice, which is an endangered species, but also other plants that are supposed to be in my community. On this, over here on this table, we have some seedlings that were even started to replant the banks of the San Marcos River so that erosion won't take a toll on the endangered wild rice. Along with these few seedlings, we have other trees that we are growing from seed, and as the years go by, we will be supplying more and more plants for this project. Right now we are collecting Texas wild rice from the San Marcos National Fish Factory, which we will then take back to the San Marcos River and collect. That's, yeah. Not a perfect dive. I'm so impressed. <laughs> so those are brand new plantings of that, the, the Texas wild rice. And if you go out there today, the area has completely filled in. They've just taken over. You very, put very it like in a grid pattern like we did? Do what? You, you put it in a grid pattern yeah. and you think it together like yeah. a mesh? Yes. <laughs> Those have not grown quite as rapidly as the TWR, which is interesting. We didn't know what was going to happen. Those did really well. It's kind of a thick, uh, succulent almost type plant. It doesn't grow very tall, but it gets really thick along the bottom. So we like to use those in the middle of the river where tubers are floating, people in tubes, so it doesn't, you know, they don't freak out from the plant. So remember, this is the first year. So a lot of this is kind of experimental. Yeah. A lot of this is based on hard science and, and research that's been done over the last... 10 to 15, 20 years, but a lot of this is still unknown, so we have to take our best foot forward and then see how it does <laughs> and tweak it the next year. Yes. Yeah, so, she had some fun with this video. <laughs> oh, that's cool. But you always have to remember that. This is the first year, so there's a lot of unknowns. It's still. been so fun. We're still trying to figure it out. So conservation crew, I want to pitch this to you guys. Um, during the summer, we, we have money, yay, to hire students. And so we hire university students to walk the river. You help with a lot of these projects. You talk to people about the HCP. Um, we, you, have, you wear the conservation crew t-shirt, the hat. And it's, a, it's up to 32 hour a week job. It pays $10 to $11 an hour. So if you're interested, please contact me. I would love to hire you. This is one of the areas that they made, the conservation crew maintains. It's an exclosure. So Texas Parks and Wildlife Department made the entire upper reach of the San Marcos River a scientific study area, which means Texas wild ice is protected. So it has a layer of protection that was never there before. These are exclosures where we have the biggest stands of wild rice, so people can't come in them at all. Um, they take a lot of maintenance, though. And this is the conservation crew out there working and teaching. So they're out working on the exclosure, and tubers float up, and they talk to it, and they help the tubers around the exclosure. Nothing, nothing, nothing. We had a flood. The EAA wanted to see pictures of the flood, so I put these in there. It was a Halloween in October. Remember when it rained so much? We really, and you guys got slammed. We got hammered. Yeah. We always get hammered. We're new brothels. So those are some of the, the people, the, the agency signatories that are involved, and that's it. Any so yeah, questions? Yeah, pretty much my projects are very, very similar, as I've talked a little bit about it. I think the only thing we do, our system's a little different than yours, so the only difference in our vegetation or installation is that we actually, we have uh, about half the size of this table, we have these trays, and we actually... We don't build our, our plants in a lab. We actually have them in the lake because we have an area that's not accessible to tubers and other people going through it. So we can actually have the, the, the lab in the lake. We actually use the same lake. We put in these big trays with all these pots and we grow them for two weeks. 
pull them out, plant them, and then do another tray. And so we, we've put in about 12, over 12,000 plants in the Comal mm -hmm. system in the Lenda Lake area by the gazebo uh, last year. So everything was on site, which is, I mean, not everything, but I'd say probably 90% of our, our, it was not built in a lab. It was, we didn't have to transport anything. It was right there on the spot. We just wouldn't swim out there and pick it up and take it over in a canoe and plant them and do some more. And we have uh, bollies that are out there sampling, so we'll know if we're being successful at all. Over about a period of five years, we'll have it figured so, out. So every year, I'm sure we're going to be publishing BioWest and all the other people that are doing this are publishing the results because there's a lot of unknown knowledge that we're figuring out as we go. A mm -hmm. lot of the invasive species, and, and there's a lot of different projects going on, a lot of different angles that they're trying to ascertain what's happening and what's the next step. And so there's, there's a lot of research and science based on all that we're doing here, a, a lot. If you ever go to the website, it's eahcp.org. Oh, yeah. There's, I don't know, 15 pages of literature review and documents and all kinds of stuff. It's, it's lengthy. If you can read really fast, it'll take you about a day. If you, if you read normal, it'll take you about three weeks. Okay, if you want a job, call this number. <laughs> and then we want to introduce oh, Kevin. This is, and this is Kevin Hose, my intern. Uh, he's been with me since last September. September. So he's been with me. Uh, he, he's also from, well, you can talk about yourself. Uh, he can talk. I graduated from Texas State in August with a degree, Bachelor's of Science in Resource and Environmental Geography. And looking to go to grad school now and applying for jobs. And I have him out in the field doing all kinds of different stuff, whether it be presenting in front of groups, which he does, some of the nonprofit organizations, some of the kid groups. A lot of our job is public outreach education to the Rotary Club or the kids groups. Or we do a lot of summer training with the kids and, you know, children's groups and stuff like that. Because a lot of this, you know, this, this is a behavioral change about elephant ears and invasive species. A lot of adults are kind of like kind of stuck in that rut. You know, kids want to learn and they want to recycle and do environmental good stuff, and so it kind of percolates through the kids. And that's, we, I, I'm better with kids anyway, so I, I like kids, and so I do a lot of stuff in the summertime with the kids. Um, and so that's one thing I have him doing also. He's he's very well versed and he's more of a biology person than I am when it comes to fish and whatnot. Yeah, he, he actually he's pretty humble. He knows quite a bit. Um, so yeah, for interns, if you, I, I don't think I have as much money as you do for interns, but. Um, I don't work you as hard as they, you know, throwing out the river, <laughs> bothering the tubers. But if you want to do an internship with me, you can also contact me. We can put our number up on the board. Yeah, and, I put uh, mine over here. You can email us or whatever. Any questions, I guess? Are we done? After? Um, when y'all were picking the access points for people to go into the river, were there, was there any strategy as to the point? Was it most commonly used? Or? Exactly. Most common, we try to try to space them out between I-35 and the headwaters, and then look for the places that were the most eroded, because that's where they're going in. So we put about seven sites out there where the heaviest erosion was. Um, I was wondering, did this, the chemical that you used for the did it have any negative effects? Maybe, it's a glyphosate derivative, and it is called rodeo, and then aquanid, it, they sometimes change brand names. All chemicals have a negative effect, without a doubt. So how you control that is how you use it. It's not so much the chemical as it is how you use it. And so he will apply it directly to the leaf, and that way it's absorbed within that plant system. And we never do the broadcast spray, because then it gets in everything all around it, and it gets in the water. Yeah, that, so, was, that was a concern with some of the neighbors. Yeah, so there's always some surrounding kill off a little bit, um, but it's also glyphosate in a product that's meant to be used in aquatic situations. For the elephant ear, is it your goal to remove it completely from the headwaters? Yeah. Completely. Is there a private land where it can still be growing? Yeah, it's a pretty idealistic goal. So upland, if you go upstream, um, Spring Lake is fed by Sink <clears throat> Creek, and you're growing pretty vertically north that way. You get into a lot of private land in the creek itself full of elephant ears. So we've contacted two landowners upstream, and we'll keep working our way up. But he's trying to get it in the river first, and then we'll... 
We try to do, like I said, the, the stuff like even in New Braunfels, we do the area that's right next to the springs because that's where most of the endangered species are. They kind of hang near the spring orifices. And so that's where we hit the, that's the first year, first step. Mm -hmm. We try to wipe out the whole section because that's where the beetles live, that's where the fountain darter kind of thrives in that little pocket area. And we've thought about going kind of further up where some of the other springs are, but that's private land. We have to work out an agreement, and mm -hmm. that gets kind of messy sometimes, takes time. But it's Usually true. They're, they're pretty good with it because they want, you're improving their property. So they're like, oh, you're going to pay to improve my property? Yeah, that's the idea. All right, come on over. You just, you know, just got to work it out. But you're right. I mean, we'll be doing it forever unless we get every last one of them. Yeah, so, exactly. One just takes We one. have funding for 15 years, and then hopefully they'll renew it. So yeah, if, it could be your next job. I'm retiring in six years. <laughs> oh, yeah, but you want my job. <laughs> your job's easier. <laughs> so, funding is from Fish Funding is from, actually, it's from everyone who pumps from the Edwards Aquifer. So San Antonio is a huge pumper of the Edwards Aquifer. That's their sole source of water. Um, the agricultural downstream, City of New Braunfels does a little bit, San Marcos does a little bit. Whoever pumps, even individual pumpers, pay an aquifer permit fee. They always have, so they raised that hugely um, a year and a half ago. And that's our entirety of our funding. So the Edwards Aquifer has all that money, and this is where we, we pay for it first, and then they reimburse us. So it's a pretty much, yeah. it's a, it, they're, paying, they're paying for all this work. So it's, uh, it's a They don't pay our salaries, though. No. No, no. Any questions from this side of the room? You guys are kind of quiet. Good? <laughs> I have a good question. Do you have the, the dredging to remove the silt from the bottom? And you'll place, you, you're currently putting it like on the land. Mm -hmm. Does it often just, you know, big rain washes it all back? And That's a rain? very good question. No, it's um, surrounded by erosion control, and then we get a bobcat in there and we pull it out. Yeah, ours is kept in actually in a big bag called the dirt bag. Yeah. It's like a big yeah. bag of like silt fence material and it's yeah. pumped into this big expandable bag. The water seeps through it. It's like a big coffee filter, yeah. very, very fine. And then we actually removed that. We actually took it to Texas State University to the, uh, the compost facility mm -hmm. there because that stuff's very rich in nutrients. Mm -hmm. I and mean, that's the best thing to put for your plants. Oh, but, yeah. Um, that stuff's $5 a bag. It's very rich in nutrients. But we ended up taking ours off site like you did. Mm -hmm. So it's very time consuming it's very hard to get it in there without tearing up the ground because you got to get in with a bobcat and, mm -hmm. but yeah we don't leave it there <laughs> we don't want it to go back in the ground in the water when y'all are doing the vacuuming do y'all happen to get any animals or even when y'all are taking out the actual plants what happens to the animals that had their home within those do they to go make a new one because y'all are taking out mm -hmm. a whole lot. So, is well, relative, so we're not by permit, we can't take each year, we can't take over 1% of the entirety of that upper stretch. And so that's our, our cap. And, and it really takes a lot of labor to remove more than that. So we really, I mean, it's piece by piece. It's very hand intensive. Um, so what they do is they pull out the plants, they shake them in the water, they give them to the guy in the boat, he shakes them additionally, and then they go into the bank. And so that, once they've stripped that area of plants, the animals are gone. And so when they go into vacuum, there's nothing there. Yeah, they kind of stir it up and they kind of walk through and kind of scare them all away. There's a couple kind of still stuck in mm -hmm. there, but generally they're kind of all scared away. But yeah, the habitat, they have to push them away from their home mm -hmm. to make it better. Because we put in native, native vegetation that's actually better for them. It's a better habitat, better nutrients, that kind of thing. It's all based on science, like I said. It's and that was one of my main concerns, because when you do, when you pull aquatic plants up out of a river, it's full of life, not just fish, invertebrates, all kinds, eggs, tons of stuff. So how quickly after do y'all replant in a specific area that y'all just finished pulling? Immediately. Okay, so you yeah. can come back and... Yeah. yeah it's kind of that. a three-layered thing. You strip it, you suck the silt out, and then you plant. Okay. And that's how we, we do the same thing. So. Mm -hmm. Very like I said, it's the process for this year, but then we lo lose that information because there's going to be changes in the riverway and the system as you change the vegetation or you yeah. put more of a vegetation in there, the water's going to change and fluctuate a little bit hydraulically. So that's all looked at and analyzed for the next year and how are things going to change for the next batch. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's, there's a lot of variables to look at all the time. So everything you, once you change one thing, it might change three other things mm -hmm. downriver or upstream or in the same pocket. It just, mm -hmm. yeah. A lot of work to do, a lot of things to analyze, a lot of scientists looking at this stuff, not just us. Not, Thank it, goodness. We might be a one-man show for what we're doing, but we're just the, the pivot point for all these other scientists mm -hmm. and companies and things going on. Mm -hmm. We just have to juggle a lot of balls all at once. 
So it's, it is very exciting. I, I have a lot on my plate. I do this plus a couple of other programs. And that's why I wanted her job, because she just does this all the time, which is awesome. I love doing this stuff, too. And it's just I have some other programs which are kind of distracting. Uh, so when she retires in five or six years, maybe three years, I can maybe move over to San Marcos. Because I went to Texas State, so I, I, I'm more familiar with San Marcos because I lived there for so long. Um, I know, I know. Yeah, you guys can have my job. <laughs> Good luck. Any more questions? Wonderful. Well, we'd like to thank... Students at TLU engage in high-impact educational experiences that include civic engagement, aesthetic expression, critical thinking, and a focus on intercultural knowledge in a community that welcomes the interplay of faith and reason.